Welcome to Lessons That Last, where a researcher and a teacher talk about what it means to make a lasting impact on students' lives. They unpack the stories former students shared about their memorable teachers and discuss how we can all make a greater impact on the people in our lives. Here's Julie and Laura. Hello, and welcome back to the Lessons That Last podcast. I'm Julie Hassan, professor and researcher, and with me is my beautiful co-host, Laura Estes Swilly, writer and teacher. It's good to see you, Julie. And you picked such a sweet story for today. I know. I get a little romantic sometimes. And I was thinking about this, and I had dinner with my friend Tammy last night, and her son is 10th grade wow. and has his first girlfriend. Ooh. And Tammy is already bracing for what she thinks will be the inevitable heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I mean, of course it's inevitable when they're in 10th grade. That's not who they're going to marry. Right. right? Well, even so, if they do, there's, there's bound to be some hiccups along the way, right? Yes, for sure. For sure. And boys just handle it so differently than girls. I've watched a lot of heartbreak come in and out of my classroom and I totally understand how the girls handle it. Uh, boys are so different. Like they, they turn in, you know, mm. there's like a glowering sadness to them. Which is interesting. Cause we always think about like girls turning in like with pain and suffering and boys sort of acting out. But not in that case, right? Not in that case, because what girls do is express a lot to their friends or even their teachers or even in the middle of class. Um, <laughs> trust me, they express. Uh, <clears throat> they write, they they scream, they yell. Um, and boys may be seeking to be the opposite or maybe they're at that age where they aren't really sure how to express their emotions because they're not allowed to act out like they did when they were 10 and they're not men yet who can constructively discuss their feelings um they just turn it in and sort of sort of turn it off mm. <laughs> except to their mamas <laughs> except to their mamas if that has been a very well paved bridge over, you know, 15, 16, 18 years. Yeah. Yes. Because they yes. don't all. Um, I worry about the ones who really don't seem to have someone to talk to or only have to talk to like another 16 year old mm -hmm. uh, who gives the worst advice, um, <clears throat> of course. But I mean, we remember, I think, boys when we were in school who would go through a breakup and they would turn wild, not yes. necessarily acting out like in class, but just acting out in their personal lives, wild partying, wild, uh, womanizing all of that. Yes. Yeah. I do remember that. And I, and I, you know, I have to think about like the mom of a, a boy of, I have a boy who's now 30, but it was once a high school boy. <laughs> yes. He was very um, attached to mm -hmm. a pretty blonde girl. And yes. So heartbroken. Yes. So heartbroken. And, yeah. you, you know, there, there's really not much you can say. Like, you want to say, like, you're going to be better off. It's mm -hmm. all, you're going to be happy someday when you find the right one. But, like, none of that is, is helpful at that point point so here's the difference with be between being the mom and the de facto aunt <laughs> i said all the things when he would call me because this happened when he was away at school um well, right you're, you're talking, talking about multiple times well, yes but yeah high school like there was a pretty big yes breakup there was school. a big breakup he would talk to me and i would say all of those things and also uh, you know, completely take his side and talk down the other party because that's, <laughs> I mean, like Connor is where my heart was. I'm going to be on your side. 100% doesn't matter who you're up against. And, right. um, but I know with like with mom, as a mom, you have to be a little more judicial because you're trying to teach him 
Yeah, I don't know what you're trying to teach them at that point. It's like when just they're in a heartbreak. Not, you know, you're just trying not to make it worse. Right, <laughs> right. And when, when you're me, you can say things that mom would not say. Yeah. Well, and lucky for him, right around the corner, he had grandma. Yes. And if yep. you need to be nurtured and loved on through some pain. That is the one. You will get your peanut butter cookies mm -hmm. and covered in a blanket. Yep. And, and he also had a sister who yes. would fight a dragon for him. So, yeah. yeah she had, had some things to say. I don't think yes. she was guarded in her. No, <laughs> she and I were very closely aligned. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it turns out, mom was right. And he is in less than a year now going to be married to the, the best Yes. I got my save the date and I was so excited that I sent him a picture of it. And then I thought <laughs> he was in need a picture of this. And I was like, I don't care. I'm so excited. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it all worked out. But in the, at the time when they're so young and they don't yeah. have that perspective, it just feel, it has to feel like the end of the world. Yeah. So think about it. When you're 16 and you suffer that heartbreak, You've only had 16 years of experience of life, but you've probably only had a year of dating experience. Mm -hmm. You don't know what to do when you're 30 and, and you have a little hiccup or a heartbreak or something like that. You've been at this for, for a good 14, 15 years and you know what to do. And I yeah. think that's why young men handle it the way that they do so often um, because they just have no clue what to yeah. do. Yeah. So as a teacher, so we talked about being a mom and an aunt and a sister. <laughs> as a teacher, when you have a heartbroken kid in class, how do you support that? It depends on the kid. So like in all things, um, in a high school, I'm taking my cues from the kid. Does the kid need extra nurture? Does the kid need to be um, sort of built up ego wise? Sometimes, yeah. Um, does the kid need space? Um, does the kid need me to absorb some of the anger that they're feeling and say, you know, I understand, I understand how you feel. That's a valid feeling to validate. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends, honestly, on how the kid uh, really wants to be handled. And they give you subtle cues for that. Sometimes for me, though, as an English teacher, I get things in their writing. And then I'm oh. able to give an uplifting note. And it's something that they may not want to talk to me about, but they can through writing. And mm -hmm. then as time goes on, I can, uh, you know, a hand on the arm, and at eye contact, are you doing okay? How are things going? And I can, either, I'll either be shut down or it'll be open. And then I'll take my cues from the kid. Yeah. Oh, I know. Okay. Heartbroken kids. And yeah. it's so complicated because everyone responds differently. Right. Yeah. And you, you haven't known them forever and ever. Mm -mm. Like, like mom or grandma. Right. Or Sometimes I've known them for a month. Yeah. Or two, and that's just that's a, a month of school days, an hour a day. Mm -hmm. That's not much, um, but I have a like a long-standing heart rule. Once you've crossed my threshold and been on my roster, you're my student, and I care about you. Period. And so I always come from from care and and like teacher love so even if it's only been a month it doesn't matter you don't have to earn that connection from me that connection is available to you yeah oh so so mrs stouffer was that kind of teacher it seems this is vince's yes. story about mrs stouffer and kind of a, a a productive we talked about productive i think a little bit in the last episode kind of a productive way of helping him navigate this heartache yeah. so would you laura read vince's story about mrs stouffer absolutely my girlfriend of three years broke up with me in october of my senior year i was devastated certain that i would never feel happy again my English teacher, Mrs. Stouffer, was always there to listen and offer support. 
One day, she suggested that a distraction might be helpful and I should consider trying out for the spring play. I did audition for the play and I was chosen for a small part. Mrs. Stouffer was right. The afternoon rehearsals were a fun distraction for my sulking and moping. I made some new friends and we shared a lot of laughs. I even met a cute girl and I eventually got brave enough to ask her out. Throughout that painful time, Mrs. Stouffer continued to support and encourage me. She helped lift me out of despair and gave me hope that things would get better. I'm thankful for her willingness to listen and offer advice. Oh, wise Mrs. Stouffer. Yes, she was smart. <laughs> and you're always a so distraction with Exactly. Wow. You're always so careful about offering advice, right? Because this is someone else's whole life. And like you said, we don't know them mm -hmm. um, stem to stern. We know them, Mrs. Stouffer, October. It was right now. So yeah. I've had my kids since August. If if this Vince went to high school up north, he had known Mrs. Stouffer a month when this happened. Right. So she went to the best universal advice, get busy. Mm -hmm. Fill your time because we've all been through breakups. And one of the hardest things after a breakup is how to fill our time because our time was filled with that other person. Right. And thoughts of that other person. Exactly. Around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> obsession. With and, th and then it becomes obsession, especially after the breakup. So right. uh, it's hard to offer advice in that situation, but she went to the best advice that you would give anyone. You, whether you knew them or not, uh, from a, a puppy love crush all the way to a divorce, you need to get busy. Let's do something new, start mm -hmm. something. And that distraction like proved to be perfect for Vince. Yeah. He had a little fun. Mm -hmm. Made some new friends. Girl. Yeah. And she, here's, here's the diabolical brilliance of Mrs. Stouffer. The drama department always needs boys. <laughs> he knew he was going to get a part. He right. could have been there's like a stack of wood and he would have gotten a part <laughs> because they always need boys. And so she was vectoring him in a way where she knew he would find footing. Yes, he wasn't going to get rejected. No. Again. Yeah, exactly. she had to have known that. Oh, she knew. He was he yes. was a shoe in for the yes. play. Uh, listen, I would I would never uh second guess sending a boy to try out for a play because I know. And, and she, she probably knew. knew. She absolutely the, knew. The girls will outnumber him there and he'll meet a new, he'll meet <laughs> yes. a new friend. At the very least, he will get some extra flirting time during practice because that's half of play practice in high school. And um, that will be good for his ego and it'll make him feel good. And they had a good time when he, yeah. yes. I know. Yeah. I think she was so brilliant she Mrs. was Stouffer. and it, it was it was not telling him that oh you're going to be okay you know mm -hmm. it was just hey here's an idea and gave him a little hope which is what he said right. he was lacking he just had lost some hope and she and he did he did sort of um maybe summarize like she was always there to offer advice and to give support and so i'm sure she said the things that we all say mm -hmm. um you know, I, I know that this looks hard now. This this feeling right now is not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you're hurting. Um, you know, I, those kinds of things we all say to even a stranger. Um, so she was able to nurture him at a time he really needed nurture. Yeah. Validated the feelings and mm -hmm. yet gave him some some ideas for how he might start to feel better. Exactly. Like that. And really, you know, when I think about this story, I think about all the potential different big disappointments that kids deal with yes. in your age group. So in elementary, it's small disappointments and, and they typically are here and gone pretty quickly. But in high school, they're dealing with some big disappointments. They right? are. Yes. So right now it is college application season. Mm. They are all working on their applications. Like the early decision applications are due tomorrow. 
So our Florida, I, I don't know if it's this way in every state, there are certain schools you can apply to as an early admission or early decision. So this is where I want to go. And so you have to submit there early. But everybody else, I think, is November 1st. So it's college essay season. It's recommendation letter season. And so the pressure is on right now. And I was talking to a student I think yesterday, uh, who was saying, okay, so I'm doing this revision and then I'm sending it off and then it's done and I can relax. <laughs> and I, in my head, I was like, uh-huh until like February, March. And then this is going to double in a way you have no clue, right? Because that's when the acceptance and the rejection start coming. And those disappointments feel earth shattering. Oh, and I can't, Let's like, try. when it was us, it would come in your mailbox. Mm -hmm. And so once a day, you could go out and check the mailbox. But right. now I'm imagining it comes it via does. email. Yep. In the and middle of class. Oh, yeah. no. mm -hmm. And so you're checking and refreshing and checking yep. and refreshing. Yes. And the person next to you got theirs their response, oh, but gosh. you haven't gotten yours yet. And what does that mean? Why haven't I gotten mine yet? Right. Wow. Uh -huh. Last year, um, I, I remember I had a TA who I was very close to, who was also in my class and she's a twin and they applied to the same school at the same time and did everything at the same time. And her twin heard back, uh, I think it was about housing long before she did. And she was like, I don't know what this means. And I said, I think it means nothing. <laughs> like, I just don't think it means anything. But they're looking at every little, you know, breadcrumb trying to suss out what does this mean yeah. for my future? So um, when you talk about heartbreaks at this age, that's the big one. The big one is coming. We also then, of course, have the romantic heartbreaks where, I mean, when you're a senior, and you've been dating someone for a couple of years, that's a major relationship. Um, and then there's a cadre of kids. I think at my school, we have about 60. Well, that's probably not true. Um, 60 in my department. I don't know about the math department who have not met their reading benchmarks yet. Oh. And their seniors are. And so the question is, am I going to graduate? And when the test scores come in, they take lots of different tests, lots of different opportunities. They also feel tested to death. Right. Um, when they start getting results, it's, it's either a heartbreak every time or a heartbreak, a heartbreak, and then finally a celebration. Um, and so there's a lot of heartbreak for those kids who are struggling, um, like almost monthly. Mm. And that is in a lot of ways, I think much bigger than oh, yeah. not getting into your college of choice, but they're in different realms. Like those, those kids don't even know about each other right. and the stressors that they're dealing with. They don't understand each other's mm -hmm. context. And when I think about these big disappointments, like there's the thing, right? There's the disappointment. And then there's the story we tell ourselves about what that means, right? Yes. Yes. So when the big breakup comes, do I tell myself I'm unlovable? I'm never mm -hmm. going to find someone good who enough. loves me. Yeah. Yep. Um, or when I don't get into the college of my choice, am I not as good, not as smart? Yep. You know, all of so some of your work, I imagine, is trying to work against the creation of those really unhelpful narratives that we tend to tell ourselves about what it means, right? Yes. Um, I feel like I am my most positive, my most engaging self at school. I mean, because no one's positive all the time, right. but I would almost guarantee my students would tell you I am because of exactly what you're saying. All I can do is build them up. All I can do is remind them of how amazing they are um, and sort of speak that into reality for them. Um, and hopefully that's a little something hidden in their hearts, but it's so much bigger than me. And they really need to hear it from home. Yeah, They really need to know that who they are before they come to school for it to really count. 
And it's a lifelong practice, isn't it? Yes. Like just becoming aware of the stories we tell ourselves mm -hmm. and counter, like I still work on that all the time. I will catch myself, something happens and I will create this whole scenario in my head. Yeah. And I don't have any shred of evidence that that's true, that this person really hates me because they didn't say good morning or whatever, you right. know, whatever it is. Um, it is a, a lifelong practice and helpful if the, the, I think the earlier we can get started with becoming aware that we're telling mm -hmm. ourselves a story and questioning that story, the better. Well, and I think we have to look at those stories because I think they speak our fears into into our minds. Mm. Some of your fears are just very low key. You're not thinking about them all the time. But when one of those weird stories, like the weird narrative where you're like, well, that's it. I have always been stupid and everyone was right. Okay. Well, A, no one ever told you you were stupid and B, you're brilliant. <laughs> um, but then why did you say that to yourself? Because that's right. the fear. Um, and so acknowledging that I think is a really important way to break it and give it so much less power because all it is, is a fear. A fear is not a truth. Hmm. A fear is a lie. Wow. That's so deep. I, I know. didn't know we were going to get so deep with <laughs> Vincent. Mrs. I feel so like I'm talking to my students so <laughs> it's because this is what we talk about. Um, not every day. And uh, sometimes whole group, sometimes three or four of them, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, because if nobody tells you this, you don't know it. I, I t I'm like, all the time I say to them, I'm old. I had to learn this on my own. Listen, <laughs> listen, <Let me> save <laughs> I, <you>. <laughs> I learned this <laughs> because those are just fears. Fears are very powerful and we believe they're real. But if we'll stop and recognize, oh, wait a minute, I just made that whole thing up. I must be afraid of that. Hmm. Then it has so much less right. power. And for all our teacher friends who are listening, when something happens and you think this means I'm a terrible teacher. Yes. This means I wasn't cut out for this. Yes. This means I'm not making an impact, whatever it is. Um, we talked a little bit in the last episode about observations and evaluations and all yes. of the ways we can interpret some of that, mm -hmm. all of the ways we can interpret student struggles and comments. And so I think we have to practice what we preach and teach too. I agree. I agree. Um, when I have imposter syndrome, which is a lot of what you're talking about, I should never be a teacher. I'm not good at this. I'm not making an impact. Um, it's October. I'm failing at everything I touch. Um, I have to acknowledge that that's a fear. That is an absolute fear to not be good enough mm -hmm. to be in front of those kids, to be next to those kids, to be teaching those kids and working with those kids. And I think if you don't have a little edge of that fear, you, you've become complacent. You want to be your best for these people. And the little concern that I might not be my best for them is keeping me honest, giving myself over to it. That's a problem. But I, I think a little edge of that is not a bad thing. That's interesting. That makes me think of Vince. So maybe next girlfriend, mm -hmm. there'll be a tiny fear. She, <laughs> He'll be a little more on top of his, know, on top of his right? game. I'd be a little more attentive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, oh, poor yeah, I, I think that works in a lot of places. I remember, you might remember this when we were in junior high, our church did the reverse church where the youth group ran the service. I do remember that. I was not involved in that, but I remember being in the pew for that. Okay. Well, service. I was giving a sermon <laughs> and I was so nervous I could barely make it to the pulpit in the first service, the 830 service, and I killed it. It was so good. I mean, it was you were golden. Saving, you were saving souls. I, I was bringing first them United home. Methodist Church yes. of Brandon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that little chapel was rocking. And then at the 11 o'clock, I had no fear. Oh. Because I killed it at 830. 
I was like, I'm so good at this. this. And it was awful. I I needed a little edge of fear to keep me on my game and do well. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's good. I learned that at the pulpit. (laughs) (laughs) So you and Vince, a little bit of fear. A little bit of fear. To keep you doing... Mm -hmm. Doing right. Yeah, right? and tell me Vince didn't walk in to a play audition with a little fear. Oh, absolutely. Right? Um, you you have to try the things that make you fearful and hold on to a little bit of fear to keep you on your toes, but also like smash the voice, smash that voice that's telling you bad things, that you're not good enough or uh, whatever it is in any realm, because there are a thousand things we tell ourselves that are complete lies. Yeah, and everything we really want is not only on the other side of fear, but requires risk, right? Yes. A relationship, a part mm-hmm. in the play, becoming a great teacher, getting into the, the college of our dreams. Exactly. It's all a risk. But it is a risk. And it, and it doesn't always work out. But we learn and we grow. Mm-hmm. And it's worth it. And when the heartbreak comes for a college rejection... I always say that wasn't your home. That place was not your place. Hmm. Wherever you go, you will find intellectual stimulation. You will find friends. You will find love. You will find community because we could drop you anywhere in the world and you will bloom. Oh, true for teachers too. So I think that's yes. a beautiful, oh. a beautiful point to to put at the end of our end of our podcast today. Yes. We will bloom. You will bloom. Yep. You will, you will take risks. You will have ups and downs. You will battle those fears and those stories in your head. And in the end, it will all work out because yes. it always does. Yes. Because you were meant to be fabulous. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So, listeners, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Lessons That Last podcast. If you love Vince's story, you can find it and many other sweet teacher stories in the Lessons That Last book available at a bookseller near you or on your computer. (laughs) (laughs) Which is very close to you. (laughs) Super close. (laughs) Have a great week, everybody. Bye, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you will subscribe to the Lessons That Last podcast wherever you listen. Give us a rating, too, which will help other listeners find us. And don't forget to visit chalkandchances.com for more stories. You can also find more information on Julie's research in books. While you're there, take the quiz to find out what kind of memorable teacher you are. I took it and was surprised by what I found. I think you'll find good food for thought. Let us know about your quiz results. We hope you will meet us here each week and bring a friend to share the conversation.